Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Um, welcome, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, spend a good bit of time thinking about what tools really mean to me, what I've dealt with with tools. As talked about earlier, there were a great many years in which I've been in this industry. There are tools that don't even exist anymore. And then over the course of time, there are tools that develop and then suddenly they're bought by other brands or they disappear or a single purpose. They started off as an individual creating or gathering information and then figuring out, wow, I could resell this and do something else with it. That's how the tools marketplace really started. So I've got a really cool laser pointer. I spent 12 years in B2B publishing. Uh, during that journey, I worked through a bunch of things, like newsletter distribution, content, you know, CMS migrations. And then I became a SEO expert really because the editor in my publication said, hey, why doesn't our internal site search tool ever return anything? So I went and I read the manual on the install of this Verity product, and then I looked at the data in which all these people were collecting. None of it was normalized across all these different publications, and none of it was tagged up uniformly. And I said, let's do this stuff. And right around that time, Danny Sullivan was starting to write about title tags, and meta tags, and description, and things like that. And I said, well, let's call it this stuff. And so when we publish it, it makes sense. But boom. I'm an SEO, and I'm an expert in my industry, and the internal site search tool works really cool now, right? So I say this because people who own sites, that is an amazing tool for you to grab data from your user base all day long, right? So many people don't mine it properly, so many people ignore it, so many people don't set it up well. Spend some time figuring that stuff out, and you'll have a ton of information to be brought to you today. Um, I did eight years in consultant various agencies. I was with Bruce Clay for about five years. I ran his training programs, his trade show operations, opened up a satellite office in New York. Got a chance to work with some really large enterprise scale brands. Gave me a perspective at the time as to how, I guess, decentralized or broken up the SEO was out of that platform and how much data was being not shared by the different groups doing things and how hard it was to bring people together. If anything, in our current environment, you have a strong opportunity where CMOs are now pulling organization structures together where they're putting paid people close to social people, close to persona marketing people, close to the SEO guy. You know, the PR guy is really a content marketing guy. And kind of, you know, do we really need a, pr a press room? Why do we have a press room? Isn't our blog, our mind about messaging, right? All these things are now kind of coming together in that large group. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the digital market transit app, which was put out by Garden, which is a cool asset that you guys should download. There's a link on the slide, so when you get it from SlideShare, you'll be able to download it and really see how CMOs are reorganizing the structure and I've spent time in strategy experience, client services, so there's a, a good variety of information that's out there. So when Josh called me and said, hey, we put on this thing about tools, right? And I've honestly been wanting to do a tools presentation for a long time because, um, well, A, I now work for a tools platform. Um, but every time I've sat in a tools presentation, it's always been like tips and tricky kind of stuff. And, if you use these tools, you're really good. If you don't use those tools, well, you just sat through a tools presentation that really didn't tell you how to do anything with your business. So, great. I wanted to focus in on that, and Josh goes, well, it's gonna be an hour. I'm like, holy crap, I've gotta fill an hour worth of tools presentation. And he goes, well, why don't you also talk about algorithmic updates, while you know, Q, you know, not provided means something, you know, where is SEO in 2014? And I'm, then all of a sudden I'm sitting there, I'm like, Gee, it's, it's an hour long enough to fit all this stuff in here and try and talk about it. So, I'm going to talk about what was covered in 2013, the reality of the marketplace. I've got some cool quotes, um, some cool information slides that'll be in there for your reference. Uh, we'll go into why things have changed and the pandas, penguins, hummingbirds, oh my. You heard that that's going to be one of the next sessions. Um, 
it's just happenstance that I named my slide the same thing that they did the session, but I guess it kind of means something, so I would suggest everybody go to that session. Um, I'm going to talk about the theoretical user journey, story arc, and what those things mean. Has anybody heard about the user journey and story arc? Anybody? All right, cool. So we've got a little bit of clue around to cover. And then kind of lump all the tools together here and how we could use them to work together. And then I'll show you some screenshots from LinkedIn and how all that stuff works. So what was covered in 2012? Um, Tail Pratt from Raven Tools did a really great slide presentation. I saw I spent a lot of time reading through it. I spoke to, with John Henshaw just recently, who's the owner of Raven Tools, talked to him a little about it, what their thought process was. And at the time, this pyramid made a lot of sense in grouping tools around these different sections, right? Now, if you're just getting started in the tool space and trying to figure out what kind of data you need to deliver, or if you're working within an organization trying to figure out how to pull all this stuff together, this pyramid still holds water. It still is very, very relevant, right? The only difference is, and it's a major difference, is you can't just segregate reporting tools or PPC tools or site structure tools. You need platforms because different teams that have never worked together come to a point in time and say, I'm looking at information. What information are you looking at? How is that information relevant to me? So the huge change is all this data is brought together in platforms. There's a number of them. Raven Tools is one of them. Bright Edge is a competitor of ours. Conductor is a competitor of ours. Search Metrics is a competitor of ours. I'm a very humble guy. I'm mentoring all of our competitors before I say, hey, I work for LinkedIn. So all of these tools do a lot of really cool stuff. I suggest you experiment with a great many of them, especially the platforms. You'll figure out where some have thresholds for beginning and ending, where are built for certain purposes, and then curtail their needs to your needs, right? And your needs, what's the most important thing you need to know about your need and the tool is your user, right? So you don't just build a website for the sake of building a website, right? You build it because you're engaging with your audience. So let's talk a little bit about the reality of this marketing landscape. Does everybody know Brian Clark, coffee blogger? Right, right. Brian's a great content guy. Bought, made, sold 13, 14 different companies. Right? He, if, how many people do web, uh, WordPress sites? So he owns a hosting company called uh, Web Synthesis. Really great hosting company, secure stuff, makes getting online, takes all that mumbo jumbo techno stuff out of the out of the mix just up and running it's a good you know it's pretty pretty inexpensive but he was just at smx west a couple of weeks ago and in his speech he said as an industry we're, we're we're just about at the end of being stupid right and i thought that was a great quote right um which, which basically i got caught up with him afterwards and it was like so brian what does brian the end of being stupid really mean it's like, well, no longer are we just kind of throwing stuff up against the wall, trying to see what sticks, where things are going. Strategic marketing plans are coming together. You're really building out thought processes. It's more proactive and less reactive. You're doing what you need to do to understand your audience, to make their life better. And in making their lives better, you're making them brand advocates. And through brand advocacy, you've got a lifelong purchase, right? That's what stupid evolves into, was what he kind of got into. And that's kind of where I started reconditioning and putting my thought processes around how I'm trying to present this data to you. And then I wanted to say, I was like, well, am I gonna have enterprise people in the audience or am I gonna have small business people in the audience? How many people work for large corporations, consider themselves enterprises, multi-divisional scenario, okay. All the guys in the back got arms up. Right? How many people are mom and pop shops, small businesses, great many different hats you own, right? So I needed a way of validating that what I was about to tell you was normalized across both sides. And Marketing Land put out a research study, and here's the URL for it, that just basically showed for all of the data current usages for enterprise and small businesses, it's exactly the same within a handful of points of each other. Right, no difference. The only real difference by like five points is the investment in social media infrastructure. And these are these are things that allow you to talk back to your audience, you know, discuss and stuff like that on websites and things of such nature. Right. 
So the good news is, you're looking at the same data that large enterprise organizations are. The bad news is, they've got way more people looking at the same data that you're looking at, right? So, and they're using a lot of tools, and they've got money to spend on tools, so you just gotta figure out which ones fit into your niche, which ones fit into your marketplace, which fit into your needs, and move that data accordingly. So I wanted to try and help you understand how large organizations are looking at tools and the flow of information. So here's a, uh, it's an interactive piece that was put out by Garner. It's called the Digital Marketing Transit Map. And it breaks things up by ad technology, analytics, creative. And I go through a number of these, you know, to kind of set the pump, you know, prime the pump and get people moving. But what you see here, what they did is show all of these interacting train tracks overlap with each other where there are, you know, stations and where there are hubs. And you can see here you've got the digital media hub where all information comes together. How many people are familiar with New York City? Right? That's like Penn Station in the digital media hub. Right? And then out here you've got the, the digital agencies, right? And they're kind of setting up shop out here. That's like, you know, I guess you call it Jamaica Station on Long Island where they come in and goes in New York, right? I guess you know um, I grew up in New York, so I could tell about my twangy boys. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, it's fine. Self-deprecating humor, I'm all cool with that. Um, all, the, all the things you've heard about guys from Long Island and all the bad stereotypes, they're mostly true. <laughs> right. So let's go through and look at some of this stuff. And I, and I pointed out areas of interest, right? So in ad technologies, talk about attribution and, and the, the, the digital asset platform. Attribution is an important part of our industry these days. You really need to know about your audience, the kinds of media they're into, how you can attribute them through certain kinds of channels, how you can market to them, right? Um, do you know, how many people heard the phrase persona? You know what the persona, all right, cool. So, the big thing in our world right now is everybody's creating information around a specific set of personas, right? Because the way I go to a website and what I do after that website is my own business and it's totally different. You know, I'm different than somebody else and how I get there and traverse the universe of channels is very different. What about psychographic data? How many people understand what psychographic data is? Right. A little less, okay. Psychographic data, and you saw Marty is gonna be a speaker and clear. If you get a chance to come and hear Marty speak, the man is like a dynamite. Listen to him, but he, lives and breathes extracting information and research around psychographic data, which is really about understanding what a person's wealth is, what, you know, what they do when they aren't doing things, and how to overlap that to other stuff, and I'll spend some more time, we can talk around that. All right, then you have uh, the data management platform, and, and that's really about how you as an organization manage your assets. In small business, not so much a big deal, kind of everything centralized. But in large corporate structures, you could have microsites, you could have brands in different divisions, you could have information in a number of different areas. That all leads to the performance areas. How do you know what the pull for the you know, performance has lagging indicators that show conversion rates drop as a result of performance problem? So you gotta figure out how to optimize for all those channels and align that to the attribution of the audience you're putting information in front of. Makes sense? Okay, analytics. Now, analytics essentially, so in the analytics space, Every piece of data we look at can kind of fall into analytics at some level, shape, or form, right? If you look at their entire channel, it stretches across all the way down to IT, uh, social media, to management, SEM platforms, you know, business intelligence, intelligence, that's an important area that we should pay some attention to moving forward. But the SEO track really feeds into this analytics, which is kind of goes past attribution because you as SEOs really have a finger on understanding what's occurring on the website. When somebody does something, how do I react to it? When something goes wrong in the PR space, how do I pull in certain people to do things to create a corrective measure, right? And content marketing guys aren't going to understand that. You know, paid guys aren't going to understand that. And in, in just recently, and I'm going to pimp a little for a second here, I think that's what we're putting out in the book called uh, book called The State of SEO in 2014, and Josh and other guys we interviewed as a result of one of the, one of the common factors that came up in, 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 in the solution set is that 
what is the SEO in 2014, right? That's a big process. And essentially, if you're in-house, you know, they're all like, we need to redefine this title, it can't be SEO, they don't want it anymore, right? And if they were an agency or a brand, you know, now they were like, the phrase SEO is fine, we're good with it. But both of them said, what it's defined as needs to change, right? The perception of what that is should change, right? And it's really about this thing, which is about understanding your audience. I'm gonna keep talking about this. And you figuring out how to way, you know, engage that audience and make them, you know, brand advocates, right? And across all these different business channels, whether it's paid, content marketing, social, again, whatever you want to call it, they will have a new acronym that'll pop up every other week. At the end of the day, the SEO is the guy that's all the girl that's gonna have the technology chops to understand how to integrate with technology, to understand how to deal with code problems. If you bring them in early enough in a design situation or a redesign, they'll be able to figure out what the user path is through things, right? And help you realign your audience segments based upon your site structure, right? Um, M&A should really speak to a, an SEO before they go and purchase a domain. Because somebody has to go and do a link analysis, otherwise they're going to buy a domain, 301 redirect that jump all the way up into your domain, it's going to get buried in there, Google's going to push out some algorithm update, they're going to look back and see that prior domain that used to own all those links to it, and now 301 to these pages, and now you own all of that spam you might jump. Alright? So talk some about link tools when we get into that. Creative, I, I spent some time a little bit talking about creative and social advertising. Not all ads are created the same. Um, you really have to figure out how to make them work for your audience. Uh, later on, I'll spend a little time talking about how to map psychographic data and creative advertising to Facebook down to landing pages. And I'll get into that stuff later on, but it'll, it'll really show you how to bring a bunch of things together. And in commerce, how many people have e commerce websites? Right? E commerce websites, right? Huge, huge sets of problems, but they don't get crawled right. You've got parametric parameters all throughout the URL. You've got canonical issues. You've got 301 issues. You've got to deal with of, of old extinct product sets. Matt Couch just uh, did a video. I don't hate being the guy that says Matt Couch just said, but Matt Couch just said. Um, there's a whole set of page expire tags that you could use so that if you're if you're a small one-time product, you know what to do. If you're a large e-commerce site, what you can do and manage that. Uh, but pay attention to these things. Um, right there too, also your internal site search tool, very important. Data recognition tool to pull things out. Um, and site retargeting, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about, well, I'll just do it now. Right. So retargeting, does anybody engage in retargeting? Right, I've got a cool retargeting story. So I'm married now for one year, right? Just had our anniversary last week. So leading up to that, you gotta get married. And before that, you gotta buy a hunky huge ring, otherwise she's not gonna marry right? <laughs> So I'm sitting at home and I'm looking at my iPad and I'm like, why the hell am I getting retargeted by engagement ring? And uh, okay. I click the ad. I go to the ad. Hi Melissa, it's been since you've been here, and here's all the little things you've been looking at. <laughs> right? So what did this little genius do? I kind of worked backwards, I found out what stone she liked, I found out what cut she wanted, what size she was looking at. All of the appropriate things that would prevent me from getting in trouble as a guy. <laughs> right? I then called up my friend that owned a jewelry shop in New York. I flew to New York. Right? That's my plain sound. Flew to New York, hired a CAD engineer, went, sat there for about four hours, looked through a bunch of diamonds, drew out the, the way she wanted the ring to look, had everything done. She got the ring, she's like, holy, that's exactly what I wanted. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how'd you know? Retargeted, like done backwards. <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about retargeting and when we deal with persona stuff. 
and emerging technologies. I only highlighted gamification. How many people know what gamification means? Gamification is a hot area right now. Definitely spend some time looking into it. It's about I can use your audience to gamify your product and you know services and stuff to get them to use use things. Like later on, I'll we talk about talk some about you know social listening devices and stuff of such nature and social broadcasting and. Companies are using polls and gamings and things on Facebook to get people to say, hi, I signed up for this, but I need you to do this so I can get more Candy Crush credits so I can open up another level. You know, that company is trying to go public and everybody's like trying to gas up the IPO. No, people on the outside have no idea what the value of this company is. They're like, it's like a stupid Facebook game. But when you say yes to using that, you give over all of your data to them. So it's actually a giant data collection company that is using games to collect information about you to sell more stuff to other people just like you. See what I'm saying? And marketing management. So I talked a little bit about the DM Hub and digital agencies, and if you notice in the digital agencies, the track, you know, social is not on that track, and that's really for an important reason. Social should be handled in-house. You're the only people that are remotely competent enough to deal with your own product set and brand. You have to be ongoing listening. Um, two years ago, Super Bowl, there was a blackout. Oreo cookies, remember the tweet? Oreo cookies, good in the dark. Right? Made the cover of Ad Age after that, went viral with a whole bunch of other people talking about it. Yeah, they had a ad in the Super Bowl, but their social media team was watching the Super Bowl and said, Oreo, it's good in the dark. They didn't need the ad in the Super Bowl. That tweet was a billion times more valuable because it was placed appropriately where the audience was when they needed it, and you know the whole story. Right? Now, when I started doing this stuff, all the contracts came out of the IT department because it was like servers and coding and stuff and we need really geeky people in rooms to figure this stuff out and it's not true, right? So what's happened? Uh, CMO, CIO, are there any chief information officers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The CMO, CIO wars are really over. The CMOs won. They got the big budgets, right? The chief information officer is kind of like a a dangling participle out here doing like whatever is brought in when it's process that needs to be dealt with, you need other things, right? And the chief marketing officer is really beginning to bring structure together around all these things because there are tools out there and they're now made on SaaS platforms and you don't need IT to go buy something to install it on a system inside your system, right? So what happens? You've got many more eyeballs, many more brains, many more perspectives, collecting and looking at a ton more data from a great many different places to create way more informed decisions. All right. Talked about mobile search. Um, again, I was just at, uh, at SMX, uh, Matt Cutts, and another couple other people said, you know, talking about Google, they were like, Within a year, 2015, 2016, we expect mobile searches to pass desktop searches. How many people have a mobile strategy as part of their day-to-day -day business? Right. That is really important. Regardless if you're just local or not, right? More people search from iPads or their phones, right? and they're getting a number of clear pieces of information coming from them. They're changing the results set, right? Google is Google One now, so you're gonna start seeing those tiles come out in those, in those result sets. Um, before I, I came here this morning, I opened up, searched for the weather and you know where we are, and I was like, oh look, my flight information is inserted at the top, you know, like a knowledge box. And it gives me a link to go check in. So I check in, so I don't have to wait in line. And it prompts me to rent a car, right? If I needed a car, I would never rent a car. No, I would have never made it here if I never rent a car. But you, you, get the, you get the deal, right? Now they're, they're injecting this information in front of you. We'll talk a little bit about what's in our goal, what Google calls the zero moment of truth in a little while. And talk about how that like to do the things. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about mobile tools, but you should definitely have a responsive design, 
triceps coming in place. Consider portions of your side like a parallax design. Um, is a person her, her name is Cindy Broom and uh, Web Moxie is, is her website. It's a number of tools you can plug in your URL, pick a device, and see how it looks in, in one of those different devices. But over time you're gonna see no longer is it gonna be web crawler or desktop crawler or mobile crawler, it's just gonna be crawler. Right? And search, this is exactly where we need to be. It starts off on the outlier and kind of moves and feeds a ton of stuff right into the heart of everything. Talk again about retargeting, mobile search, SEO tools. Um, social, spoke a little bit about social. Um, what's cool here, we got blogs, social marketing, social analytics, and content marketing. Um, again, if you really want that press room when your blog is way more shareable and more of your audience is on your blog than is in your press room, right? Isn't the job of PR to get people to talk about your business? Not necessarily to tell, uh, make an announcement, right? You want people to do things with that, to write about your audience. And then content marketing. I think people feel they have a definition of what content marketing is. It's crazy. I go to all over the place. And I'll, I'll be like, what's content marketing? So I'll be like, oh, it's the creation of infographics. <laughs> no. Right? Um, how many people know, uh, heard of this guy named Daylight, soccer player? Right? So content marketing is a really old thing. Right? It's not new. It's been around for a very, very long time. Right? Um, Barbasol used to do commercials on TV before there were commercials. TV used to be brought to you by Barbasol. That was content marketing. During the World Cup, Pele showed up, kneeled down, tied his shoelaces, and the camera zoomed in, zoomed in on him while he was tying his shoelaces. He had his Puma shoes on. By the very next week, every kid was out there buying Puma sneakers or Puma cleats, right? Um, Red Bull. How many people have heard of Red Bull with the Red Bull in their magazine? Right? Red Bull does a ton of work marrying every piece of marketing they do to the audience and their lifestyle and their engagement. They sponsored whatever the hell that guy's name is that jumped off that platform that broke the sound barrier. Holy crazy, right? Did he just do that? Yes. But right there on that top, Red Bull, this crazy daring thing. And they've got, you know, every kid's out doing GoPro uh, videos and they're sponsoring those channels and everybody, you know, they got that stuff all over. So content marketing is really about understanding your audience, understanding where they are when they're not on your site, to create a relationship with you to them without pushing brand message. Right? I mean, that's kind of like an easy way for me to do that. There's a website called the uh, Content Marketing Institute, Joe Pelosi. Um, I highly recommend reading or, or checking that site out. Tons of information about that, uh, about content marketing there. So what's changed in 2014? Penis, penguins, hummingbirds, all not? So Google algorithmic updates. If you do things correctly, you should not be getting penalized. In fact, you should probably be doing better as other people get penalized. So you have to look at these things as stepping stones to understand where the algorithm is heading at a certain level, a certain point, so you know how to interpret that so you are staying ahead of it. The old world was, how can I find a crease in the algorithm in a gray area in the corner that I can take advantage of and do some tips or tricks and game the system? And that stuff doesn't exist anymore. At least it doesn't work nearly as well as it used to. Right? So your focus on this stuff is to pay attention to what they're messaging out is important to them, so you can make sure you're in line with that to protect your audience. Because at the end of the day, you're all about protecting your audience, and through protecting your audience, you have this gateway of your websites and information that you're sharing with them. Another big update that just happened uh, a week or so ago was the guest blogger update. Is anybody familiar with the guest <laughs> blogger update? Right. So guest blogging was like a really cool way for people to gain the system and do this guest blogging thing. And they would get by products without would be links, and if you did guest blogging as a result of trying to get links, well, you got penalized with this update. But what also happened is fallout from this is there are websites that have true guest bloggers. Somebody said, website A, talk to authority, person, you know, individual over here, and said, we really want to do an interview and a conversation with you, 
And as a result of that, you get a blog post and we'll put, you know, authorship accreditation and some links in there and back to you, whatever. Really good stuff for the value of the user. Well, what happened? That um, stuff got scraped. And then those head terms and that authorship information got put all over a bunch of spammy sites. And that brand then got dinged as a result of this update, right? So you've got to really be careful in understanding where they're going because that was, it could have just been really simple. Don't put the key most branded term as the anchor text in the accreditation link. You could just use the word a site, you know, people know. You see what I'm getting at? Use the no follow or something, such nature. And I'll leave more stuff about pants, penguins, hummingbirds, and stuff to the very end, to the next presentation, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, I guess. But these guys have caused havoc to a lot of people. And one of the things we've talked about at our, in the book interview across, I mean, there was probably about 50, 60 people, is at what point do these things become useless? And a lot of people are looking to the point where these algorithm updates are you know quality updates that the engines are doing to fix their product for the user and it's not causing these crazy rifts where people aren't chasing these things or gaming the system right and the only real way you can go about doing that is by paying attention to information coming out of, of tools right and understanding what your user's theoretical journey is now i asked earlier does anybody know what the user's theoretical journey is do you have any idea how many users come to your site how they move across your site, why they get there, what they do when they're there, what channels do they come in from, right? So, I'm just going to talk about three channels. There are a great many more marketing channels, and there's way more touch points than four, and the distance goes from time of discovery through latency, that's all the time in between discovery through conversion across these channels. That starts off with, and we'll just say the hypothetical is paid, social, and organic, and I'm just going to use Google Zero Moment of Truth. And this is that point where marketing, word of mouth, needs and stuff occur because you're doing all of these things that people kind of find the need for something, right? Before, this is called the first moment of truth, which was when somebody sees your product and finds, oh, I have a need for that. Well, Zero Moment of Truth now is all these other things, messaging and Walk by messaging on billboards and whatnot are all triggering people to come in. And the barrier to entry across these channels is it doesn't exist anymore. The user traverses them on a pretty regular basis. So the zero moment of truth eventually leads to discovery because they find a need for something, they start searching for something, and then they discover or touch your product, no matter what channel they come in from. And then across those channels, there's latency, and that's the length of time from discovery from conversion. And people don't, aren't just one and done anymore. They don't just come in and say, hi, I've seen something for this one channel, I've got to now go make this purchase, which is why all these marketers are pulling tools and assets and <coughs> resources together to make giant teams. And they'll touch pay a number of times, or social a number of times, organic, and then finally they'll make a conversion, and that's when a purchase is made, no matter which channel or how many times they were touched. So in the past, when we first started off trying to monetize things or create needs for budget, it was like, last click point attribution is the way we need to model things because that's where the conversion occurs, right? And then some SEO came along and said, well, without discovery, you don't have last click attribution. So it's first touch point, last touch point. And now it's really multi-touch point, right? There's multi-channel attribution. Uh, there's multi-touch point, there's micro-conversions, right? How many times do people touch you very little just through this, their browsing your site? And then there's story arc. And this is you understanding your persona, you understanding the psychographic data, so that you can, through all your different platforms, whether email, print product, um, your website, paid, social channels, you can talk to your audience a great many number of ways, so that these different attribution eventually lead down to marketing automation, right? And you got things like Marketo that's doing this, Salesforce is doing this, Alpha is doing this, HubSpot's doing this, throwing out names and tools so you can keep, you know, list them as you go along. This is basically allowing you to create scoring mechanisms so as you're going through your day to day, you're not doing all the following. You have all these pre-programmed responses that allow you to get customized messaging out to your audience in a way that makes sense to them when you need them, right? 
And when you put the theoretical journey and uh, story arc together, you get something that looks like this. You get a sales funnel via personas and marketing channels. So here, this persona touched paid twice, touched organic twice, became a qualified lead in social before they finally made a contract. Right? So that's five touch points across three marketing channels. Right? That's really the reality of your user. Right? And many of them are coming back and forth. And sometimes they come in from one, and this usually happens after they've become an advocate, and it's usually a brand. Right? They, go, they just look for your homepage, and they go right to your homepage, or they go right to your product, and they buy that product. Right? And stuff like that usually happens after a number of things. But that, that's how those things occur. Joe Pelosi uh, wrote a book, I, I noted it here, what's it called? Um, marketing Content, uh, Managing Content Marketing, The Real World Guide for Creating Passionate Subscribers for Your Brand. It's a thin little book, it's got an orange cover, it's a couple of hundred pages, really talks about um, how to build this out for understanding your assets and how to build out a map for this, right? So tools and platforms, finally, what you came in with, right? You're like, damn, this guy from New York doesn't shut up. All right, so we wanted to worry about algorithm and issues like that, so I want to put some history here and tools. Um, Moz has a cool tool that talks about algorithm history and this thing called MozCast, which gives you the volatility of history. A gentleman by the name of Dr. P. P. Myers, a really smart guy, he, he did a PowerPoint, uh, you can find it on SlideShare. Uh, it's not about 10 blue links anymore. It talks about the several hundred different types of ways a Google page can be rendered as a result of all the information being brought together. Another good asset you guys should look into. Um, there's Algoru, there's CERT volatility, all these have you know, a limited amount of information in them and show in that space. Um, the Google algorithm change history, this is really good. So if you go back and you look at that and you figure out what was occurring in certain times and then what might have been happening to your domain during that time, you get an idea of how to come up with a, a solution to fix that. So, so wouldn't it be cool if there was actually a tool that allowed you to connect your analytics to something like this? And there are. Right. In the Serve Volatility Index, you can start tracking your website so you can see where things happen and how that relates to your, your analytics. Uh, Barracuda, it's a UK company, and it does this really nice thing. You log into your analytics and it shows you the dates in which updates occur so you can figure out what happened at those times. Right? And SERP ranking. How many people pay a lot of attention to your SERP rankings? How many, people, how many people on the agency side have a lot of people that bought their clients come up to you? Well, it's my ranking, when you look at my ranking, it's not what you're talking about, my ranking is, why is my ranking right there? Well, and we've all heard this, ranking's dead, ranking's not dead, ranking's important, ranking is important. Ranking's important to an extent. It gives you a date time measurement, it's a point. You gotta trend line this stuff out over time. You gotta quantify that with additional information, right? You gotta make sure that What's occurring is what you need to occur. So when you're looking at it, you see a problem, those things will change. Um, I was talking earlier with people around the room and some were saying, we were looking at our rankings and our traffic dried up, right? Well, that happened and they were able to go in and fix that because they were monitoring their rankings. It's just a set of data points that allows you to figure out what you need to do in other, in other scenarios. It by no means is the final justification of the value of your business. Make sense? Because you can rank for a lot of stuff and nobody can convert all day long. Right? So, Authority Labs, they're really cool guys. Uh, Serps, Rank Ranger, uh, Rank Tracker by Moz, uh, LinkedIn. Did I tell you I work for a company named LinkedIn? Right? Um, what triggers the need for them, right? You gotta do research for existing projects, new projects, social listening, right? In the past it was you did keyword research and you were lucky if you refreshed that set, you know, once a year or you know, twice a year. Now with all these good different companies and groups coming together, paid people should be sharing keyword information to figure out where you rank for those. News people should be figuring out what's what's occurring uh, on a day-to-day -day basis because you might be able to capture lightning in a bottle if you 
news jack really quickly. Um, social listening devices, is it, is it negative intent, positive intent? Did a newsworthy event occur? Or, you know, are you an insurance company? It's kind of morbid, but are you an insurance company? Was there a natural disaster? Did you need to you know, dispatch people to go work in that area? Is there an opportunity at some level? You see what I'm getting at? You've got to try and figure those things out. And around that, you're always putting keywords in and you're pulling keywords out. It's kind of like the whole pokey. But you don't always need to have things in there tracking all the time. Sometimes it's for a short period of time, and sometimes you've got your major set of keywords that you're tracking trending over a long time because of part of your business. Right? Google Webmaster Tools. How many people spend a lot of time on Google Webmaster Tools? Great place to find a ton of information. The only problem is it's like 90 days. So unless you hire a person to download every one of those possible CSV charts and bring them into a dashboard and you know store them somewhere else on a database so that you hope doesn't crash because you're going to lose all your information that you've been running your entire business on, it's great for a little bit of information. So what you really want to pay attention to are queries, impressions, click-through rates, and you know change the view, change data so you understand you know where you are in that perspective of the timeline. Dive into individual keywords, discover your top performing pages, take those top performing pages, throw them into SEM Rush, figure out what other domains are similar to them, figure out what other keywords are similar to that page is ranking, then take those keywords and those other domains and throw them back into SEM Rush and figure out what other keyword sets are they ranking for and what you see how this kind of occurs, right? Um, Gather authorship information. Long form articles are a big deal these days. You start noticing them on the bottom of the SERP. Start paying attention to them, right? Um, canonicalization. One thing I've never seen work well in the canonical tag is, you know, page one, you know, page ten, canonical, page nine, and, you know, the, the next and previous canonical. I've never really seen that work well. What I have seen are page one canonicaling up to the full article. Right? And now what is Google going to do? They've gone and made these long form articles that rank on the bottom. So investigate those queries, that long form piece is showing up. It's still a new area. There's not a lot of long form stuff out there ranking. It could be a good opportunity for you to jump in into page one on a SERP for a topic to create some really good opportunities there. We talked about problems with links, disavow, uh, duplicate canonical issue. I'll spend some time talking about structured data in a little while and page speed. So keyword research now provided. How many people find that to be an issue? Learn to embrace not provided. It ain't coming back, right? Um, Google took a position and they said, we're not showing you this data because we're protecting our users, right? The hypocrisy of that statement is, we're still gonna give you that information on the page, right? So, just at SMX, Amit and Matt also had a kind of tweet conversation going back and forth. And there is some changes occurring around not provided. So, um, what's the name of the article? It's uh, searchengineland.com, Google not provided review. Um, they came up with four scenarios and how that is going to change. My opinion, and I think the running opinion, that they're going to suppress more data from the paid side to protect their position on protecting user information. So, keyword research, you're a marketer, right? If you just market the refer information that you already know you're ranking for and then optimize for that, that's like definition of loop, see loop over and over and over. You're already ranking for it, you're already optimizing for it. Do something different, all right? So I gave you an example of how to use SEMrush. Talked a little bit about how to use uh, social listening platforms to create some discovery, right? Talked about investigating, interrogating long form articles, right? Um, don't just do keyword research for your head terms. Don't just do keyword research for your brand terms. Do keyword research for negative terms. Do things about your competitors' terms. Do things about associated projects or products relative to the persona. I, I had a friend who worked, for, so part of being an SEO is all of a sudden all your friends who have a website and want you to do SEO stuff. Right? 
I got tons of those, you know. Chris, it's 8 o'clock at night, but can you give me like just 15 minutes? And 15 minutes is like three hours. So he works for a company that does, uh, one of the things they do are these things called challenge coins, which are, you know, fire departments do them, police do them, coins that commemorate events and stuff like that. So they optimize for all these things, challenge coins, and you look at their keyword research, and it's like 10 terms around the phrase challenge coins, what will challenge coins, you know, that, and I'm like, why, why, what, what, what's wrong with this? And he's like, well, that's what we're trying to convert on. I'm like, great. What about softball leagues, amateur softball leagues, bar leagues? What about softball equipment? What about all the things a person needs to do to become a member of a league or buy softball equipment before they join a team that may eventually might want to decide to buy a coin from you? He's like, nobody ever told me that. <laughs> So think about it in those in that way, right? You all probably find hundreds, thousands, way more keywords and phrases than you need to think about, that you'll be like, thank God, not provided here because I'm no longer stuck thinking around these things. Right? So again, and again, think coming mode, right? Because you have Dictionary, rhyme zone, synonym, or a meta glossary. These are associated phrases, right? Like kinds of piece of information. Hummingbird did a lot of stuff, and it's about the semantic. One of the things it is that we understand it is about understanding the semantic markup of the words around the words relative to other things that it has to do with when it's not necessarily on this page. So that's why you can't just optimize a page for a set of keywords anymore. You really have to align that to an audience, a segment, or persona. Does that make sense? Also, don't forget Google. Google tells us junk all day long. Just start typing, right? Keyword. Oh, look at what came up. Planner. I don't want a planner. I'm looking for research. Research. Tool. Oh, look, I took the word tool. And what do I get? So, for your business, just kind of start typing some words and see what Google suggests. And as a result of that, look at those other bottom URLs on the end of the SERP and figure out what they're suggesting. Take some of those top URLs, put them in some of those competitive analysis tools, figure out what domains are ranking for those, for, for those URLs and those phrases. And then go and take that and then throw those into SEMrush and find all the keywords SEMrush is telling you about those domains. See? Here's another one that I kind of like for those that really need Go to Google Docs, open up a sheet, type shirt, shoe, pants, highlight it, right? And then if you're in a Apple, do option for Mac or control for a Windows machine, select it and pull down. All of a sudden, what do you get? Shirt, shoes, pants, shorts, socks, jacket, shoes, tee, skirt, dress. It puts a whole bunch of other randomized phrases and terms that might be associated with those particular. So get some story starter ideas going, get things moving forward. If you get kind of stuck somewhere, let something else do the work for you. Structured data. How many people spend are spending a lot of time analyzing structured data? All right. Here's my feeling on structured data. Right. Pay attention to it. Because if your data, it's, it's about marking up your data in a way so Google can present it in a way that an audience will react to it in a more favorable way. It has absolutely nothing to do on rankings. It has everything to do with presentation. Okay? So there's, you can go to Webmaster Tools and there's rich snippets and that'll show you what your pages look like if they're marked up correctly. Schema.org has a whole bunch of predefined schemas that you can build into it. And this is one of the easiest things you can do because you can code this and create a page template in your CMS, send it off to your IT guy and pull the data in and mark it up really nice. Um, Raven Tools has a schema creator, and Gnome has another one. Um, but it allows you to put things like ratings and directed by and other markup that gets inserted in, you know, cooking time, images. Here's what I think is happening as a result of all of the schema that's going into service in the engine call these days. Well, Google purchased a company called Freebase, which is essentially uh, like a Wikipedia. 
If you go to, all right, I'm not telling you this, but I'm telling you this. If you go to Freebase and start looking through your assets in Freebase, how it's written, you can understand what they're talking about. And if you edit those pages and manipulate them a little bit, you can have influence over what Google is bringing into some of their knowledge boxes, which is where they're pulling some of the initial data set. Okay? So what's happening is Google's going out, and that's why I put up this scraper story I'll tell you in a second. It's taking data from here, and you can manipulate the data in three days, and then figure out how it's presented. Mark it up right, and get a Google box. Right, get a knowledge box somewhere, right? Now here's the downside of what I think is happening. Google's training us in many instances to look to these knowledge boxes over on the right hand side. They're now starting to appear on the top, right? You're now not having to go through the SERP to discover anything. I didn't have to go find you know, the airline to log in to do whatever. Google put all that information right at the top. I just clicked it. I bypassed all sorts of stuff. What if I needed to go to your brand to try and buy something, right? If that was the end game. An example of that is I have a friend who worked for a major news website and they were covering March Madness last year and they were marking up everything and Google went and put the brackets in the knowledge box at the very top and traffic in all of his March Madness pages where they had sold tons of advertising based upon last year's marketing blah 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 blah, blah gone. And what happens? So I think Google is going to be taking a lot of this markup language and understanding it and using it because their job is to keep you inside Google, is to return results for you, the user, but they want to sell ads to business. Now, I find this amusing, this scraper site knowledge box, because um, Google, a couple of weeks ago, made an issue about you know, scraper sites and whatnot. And their man, and, you know, it's a prelude to the um, guest blog update. And this guy went out and Googled the phrase scraper site, and lo and behold, just above the search result of that box, just below the SERP result, inside the SERP, was the domain that Google scraped to put that very same box at the very top of the SERP result. So this guy tweeted it, it went pretty viral, it was kind of like a goofy joke, but you see what's happening, right? So own your data, mark it up as a result, because your audience is looking for it to, to engage with, but just pay attention to it, because I do think Google is getting smarter with how they can Page speed performance. Uh, how many people pay attention to this, this stuff? Right? This is really, really important stuff. Right? If you're an e-commerce site and you drop by a page performance by a fraction of a second, your conversion rate drops you know, exponentially. People need things at a certain speed of time. Understand which you know, locations people are coming from. Right? You might discover earlier on that you have a lot of people waking up on the East Coast following a trending news story. Well, if you suddenly figure out how to read into that log file information and understand that, you could have automation sent up to then start sending out a news blast based upon all the people that you know that are signed into your newsletter that are in the zip code on the West Coast. So when they get up, your news information is in their inbox. And then they come on and all of a sudden they crash your server. But you see, you see what I'm getting at. Um, I worked for a um, an agency, and we were doing a project, and told them all the stuff we we're doing. And all of a sudden, we started getting, you know, traffic was going up, you know, paid impressions were going up, server loads were getting in, right? IT guy, what did he do? Locked it. So, two weeks go by, a month goes by, I got the owner of the company yelling at me and all sorts of four letter words, right? Come in for a meeting, I think I'm getting my whatever, you're about to get green out, and I look in and I see the disavow, and I, I, I see the, you know, the, the change in robots TXT and all that stuff. I call up the IT guy and I said, what happened? Oh, admin, blah, 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 and I'm like, okay, right. come into the meeting, I'm there, CEO's there, IT guy's there, the gentleman who actually touched the keyboard to make 
very dumb mistake just sitting right there. I told them all this stuff. I put the one screenshot up and I showed them that. And the CEO looked at me and apologized. His face turned deep red. He looked at this guy who, I don't know, might have been related to him, but he yelled at him and he goes, You are on double secret probation. <laughs> right. and I don't know if that meant something special in their organization, <laughs> right? But here's a guy who clearly didn't understand the value of it. So there was no education that went through to him. He thought he was doing something. So the end result is we created multiple server farms, one for the users that allowed them within a certain level of threshold performance to, to be stable based upon their use rates and a whole bunch of load balancers and stuff like that. And then we put a whole bunch of really high profile, fast, zippy servers over here that had a mirror of exact, the exact same stuff. And this was a long time ago, but before we had you know, content distribution networks and stuff like that. So we would send the bot over here, the bot would crawl everything, verify that it was the same stuff over here in the live site, because that's one of the things that it did at that time. But they had a server that was really fast and it didn't impact user experience and they got a ton of stuff. That led to bringing more users, a lot of stuff able to be found. So monitoring performance, understanding servers, understanding what's going on, and where people are, what's occurring. You know, these are important things. Um, competitive intelligence, right? We talked a little bit about, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the people you think are your competitors aren't really your competitors, right? Um, People online are different than who they are. But what you need to do is you need them to have a conversation with your management that says, what are our objectives? Are we going after a new marketplace? Are we trying to build up protection against other people coming into my marketplace? Am um, I dealing with a reputation management issue? Right? You know, map out and read, read or research method, conduct your data collection, you know, review and analyze and summarize, and then start baselining that. All of these tools allow you to create that level of information into a report so that you can say, here's my audience, we agree this is my audience. This is what they do, we agree what they're doing. We understand that there's a way for us to monetize this, so we're gonna do something to monetize that. And then we're gonna baseline and say, this is what where we're gonna begin with, because we understand that that's our entry point. And then over time, you continue to recheck that, and you keep looking at this information, and if you move in the right direction, great. Uh, other things you might want to look at are uh, Uberview for brand insights, uh, Kiss Metrics for customer intelligence, uh, Crazy Egg, uh, where people click visualization maps. So there are other cool tools to figure out what's occurring on your site and what's occurring within your area. All right, uh, link analysis. So a lot of things you want to figure out is, if you just look at link analysis from the one standpoint, you're trying to say, what's the domain strength, the page strength, are they coming from the same IP, root domains, what's the distribution across your pages, unique keyword, all that stuff is really important. Um, you can also um, download the data, the CSV from Google Webmaster Tools, um, reorganize it in the same column heads that uh, Screaming Frog uses, color code them, upload that together as a mapped CSV file together. So now you have all this LinkedIn information mapped together with Google with Screaming Frogs crawl data. So you could use that in a number of ways of putting more data sets together. Um, but there's, how many people familiar with outreach? outreach? So outreach in, in the scenario here is, you discover who's linking to your site and who has, and who's now linking to those people. Right? So what you then do is you do the analysis of that linking page. Find out all the people that are linking to that page and then start following them on Twitter, find them on LinkedIn, comment to them, write to them as authors, create a relationship to them and say, hey, you found this piece of information very important. I was the original publisher of that information. I'm over here. Maybe you might want to point people in this way because I've got more information that's pertinent to your audience. Are you creating more content? Can I help you with anything? Content outreach, content distribution, content marketing. Right? And you guys, I work with you guys. Uh, that joke's come on. All right, social listening platforms. 
again, this is a Forrester report, so I put the URL there, so I want you guys to be able to find that information. Um, understand sentiment in which people are talking about. Um, I didn't change the tools that they listen, but Sysimos Heartbeat is another tool that you might wanna, wanna look into that does that. Um, help marketers plan their programs. These tools aggregate content, analyze the data, uncover insights. Remember I told you there's social listening people out there trying to figure out what your audience might be doing. Take those keywords, put those keywords into your set, figure out what domains rank for those keywords, start tracking those domains, then take those domains and put it, and then do link analysis on those domains to figure out, you see where I'm going with all this? You can't do this in separate tools. You gotta kind of put them together. And then reach, right? These help you know, find new audiences by sending out information right through broadcasting. Um, Kenshi Social, Salesforce, Social.com, uh, Cloud for Business, not just a regular cloud score, you can do other things with cloud. Um, again, I wanted to list the domains that they mentioned. I didn't change any, but any from their initial list. Um, let's see. Great other ones? No. And then depth platforms, right? These two uh, help to build content experience to, to, to marketing sites, right? Uh, it allows you to distribute your content to other audience segments through their partnerships. So you might not get a link back, but your pertinent information will be on another domain, right? Because our voice does that. You know, there's a ton of them in here. I definitely suggest you look at it if you say I. I'm a beginner, I can't go out and hire all the people that need to do all that content marketing, outreach stuff you're looking at, or create all this stuff and distribution channel relationship. Well, find a way of creating some sort of entry level contract with some of these guys, writing really good content that's relative to your audience, and figure out how you can distribute your content to their partners. Right? Makes sense? And then relationship platforms, right? These are engaging with your customers, right? So it's um, publishing, monitoring uh, customer posts, managing their workflow, uh, all sorts of things that allow you to communicate with your audience over time. So remember I told you about, I was gonna talk about retargeting and social stuff. I said I talked about it a little bit. So you might wanna take a couple hundred bucks, maybe a couple thousand dollars invested in a Facebook advertising program where you can get really niche into um, the psychographic data around an audience, right? Send that to a landing page that's designed for conversions, right? From your main site, create a bunch of content to support that landing page and interconnect those things up into that landing page. Take some of that other money and put it into a paid program. Now what you have, you have psychographic data around an audience segment, developing relative to a persona to an actionable query that you know is going to convert because people are clicking on it on the main side. String all that stuff together, and what do you have? The ability to create story arcs, the ability to create content, right? And you did this by taking a bunch of information from disconnected sources and putting it together and doing this data overlay thing that you're talking about. And these, this social relationship stuff all looks like this. You have listening platforms, a lot of plan. You have your reach platforms, where you talk to them, engagement, add them to your site, right? Do the comment and the blog and all that thing. And keep measuring. Again, this came from Forrester, so I'm not the wizard that thought that one on. And at the very end of this, you have things like multi-channel attribution, Content marketing automation, uh, outreach, you know, uh, reportive is a cool little other thing you put into your, you're connected to Google, your Google, your Gmail, and when you're emailing a person, it puts the picture up on the right hand side, and all their social profiles makes it really easy for you to connect with them. And so when you're building all those relationships, it's good stuff. Budstream allows you to find people that are of importance for a certain topic. LinkedIn does stuff like that too through influencer authorship and network development. And I'll talk about that. Have I got you interested so far? Mm -hmm. all right. So how does this all work? Well, a quick recap. I work for this company. You knew it was going to come up. So how does this work on a platform level? And 
I'm a fair guy. I think all these platforms do great things. I won't talk negatively about them. Although there's some interesting conversations happening between private and search metrics at the moment. But are you guys familiar with that? Right. Just Google lawsuit or patent infringement between Bright Edge and search metrics, and that's a pretty cool conversation. Uh, many of these two tools were designed, in my opinion, many of the tools were designed to service the SEO. Many of these tools were designed that need a lot of technical markup and tagging to implement. All of them bring tons of data sources together, right? Um, Raven Tools is really a tool that's a framework of tools and APIs, right? They bring a lot of stuff together. I'm good friends with John Henshaw, and I love his tool, right? Linkdex, what made Linkdex appealing to me when I was talking to them, was it has all of that, all the bells and whistles that an SEO need, a crawler, it has keywords, serves, and all sorts of other stuff in it. But when you then take that data and mark it up properly and tag them into different groups and matriculate through the platform, it takes link data and spins it in a certain way. We go out and get the majestic, fresh, and the historic. We recrawl all those URLs at 500 URLs a day to make sure they're still there and take a bunch of other information off of that page to understand who's linking to that page. Um, not just that that page is linking to you, but what's the other demographic around that page, the social profiles, the authorship that influence. So that then allows you to take that information and discover ranking authors around the keyword sets in which you are trying to have influence over. And that then allows you to take information and position it into what's called a network visualization. So if you couple like-minded people together, you can really visualize which ones of them have influence over each other, right? So here, start off by developing a baseline and ranking. You put your keywords, URLs, match type, country, what engine, geo, language, search volume, CPC, you can put conversion rate, geo volume, tagging, right? This is, is it for brand, is it for product, is it a competitor term? Is it the social team's turn because they listen to this negative sentiment that allows you to then manage those groups through the platform? Um, you can configure click-through rate. You know, for standard, the standard click-through rate is this based upon data we get out of Google. But my graded terms for my website are going to click, have a click-through rate by position at a much different response time, right? So the the number one position is going to have a much higher click-through rate. If, I, if my, I'm brand X and somebody searches for brand X and I'm number one, chances are they're going to click on it a lot more than 34% of the time, right? So if you understand that click-through rate configuration and the conversion rate value, you can build a customized configuration. So when you do, there's a forecasting section in the platform that will allow you to then figure that all out before you can do your math for projects. And then you come in here and you put in your ranking information and what it allows you to do is you can create ranking configurations by US market, by international market. There's 200 something countries you can do it in there. There's hundreds of different languages and dialects you can do in there. You can do it down to zip code inside the United States. So when you look for your service information, you can then say, oh, I only want to see what's happening in Seattle. Seattle, and it'll, it'll read. You know, it, it'll reset the, the, the grouping. Tells you the, UR, the, the keyword, what tags, the universal stuff, URLs. And this is stuff a lot of other SERP tools have also. I'm just talking in the sense of how it's all playing together based on um, some of the stuff that I was speaking about earlier, right? And then you come in and you got the crawler, right? You've got all the stuff you would see in Screaming Frog. You can create a number of different crawls by date, by type, by location. Request crawl, you can name it, a start page, a specific path, ignore paths, only look for certain kind of parameters. You can select the amount of URLs you want to go down. You have a product called Deep Crawl, so if you're a large enterprise organization, you can crawl up to hundreds of thousands and millions of URLs. Try doing that with an average crawler on your machine, not happening, right? We then, on a page-by-page -page basis, 
um, bring back issues we've discovered. Tier is basically, we're UK company, so they use the word tier, not directory, but tier is basically, top tier is like, you know, where they went into the crawl, which is most likely the home page, and tier two would probably be top navigation, right? In my head, I matriculate and want to say directory structures, but they use tiers, I don't know, platforms, like the network, uh, by page, internal links to that page, links from this page, out to other sources, external links to this page, social profiles. If you hook up your analytics, we can tell you the visitors from multi-channel attribution, your engagement rate, and if you have your conversion stuff hooked up here, we can tell you the top ranks, all the links associated with it, um, and then there's other data that's down there also. But again, this is a lot of stuff a lot of the other platforms do. Other tools do it in different sections, I'm just trying to share with you. Uh, and in here, going to the, the, the link analysis, it allows us to find a domain, all the social profiles, where the links come from. Is this domain influential over its audience? Relative to the keywords that you have in the project, is it relevant? You can search for uh, site types, we break it up by blogs, blog sites, you know, so it depends upon what types of websites you're trying to relate to, TLDs. Um, you can look for sites that only have specific uh, social profiles. Um, if you're right, if you're a b 2 b -er or you're using or trying to leverage your enterprise executives, your C-suite, chances are the relationships you're trying to build as a part of outreach are going to be wrapped around LinkedIn, so it's important to figure those relationships out. And then you come in, you identify these authors, and you can figure out their profiles, what they wrote, what keywords they rank for, all the keywords that they rank for that you might not have consider to build that into your project. You can create a contact, reach out to them, and then get in, I'm getting pulled off the stage, please. Yeah. And, and, then, and then get built, you know, build out that content relationship. And then structure all these things together and you can figure out the network relationship between how far are you from this person who has a large influence over a great many people in the network, right? And I also don't want you to forget about tools like this. I mentioned crazy agents metrics. <coughs> Origami logic, overview, influencer, discovery, content performance. These are a great many other tools you want to look into. That's me. That's my title. That's how you need to get in touch with me if you guys want to talk more.